we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 613, Pluto's Demotion, 15 years later. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and with me as always is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I, I can't believe that the 15th anniversary of Pluto's demotion means we've been doing this for 15 years. Our very first episode was the week after that event. Now you've just stolen my introduction, but that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. It, it's a little different. <laughs> um, yeah, 15 years. That's amazing. 613 episodes. Uh, uh, man, I, like my children were born just before we started doing the show. And yeah. now they've, they're all moved out of the house. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> wild. And the technological yeah. revolutions that we've watched, we we started out talking together on Skype and recording mm -hmm. locally. We went to Google Hangouts. We've jumped to Slack, to Discord, to Twitch. We yep. are bringing you a whole new layout today. Yes, it only took us half an hour to get all of the technology to finally settle down and and uh, serve our bidding. But uh, it, it's cool if you have a chance, you know, go to YouTube, watch the live stream and then get to about the halfway mark and you'll see the the new intro. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. So where did that new intro come from? That came from Noel Rubenthal. He's one of our community oh, members. Awesome. And he took the, the audio from uh, David Joseph Wesley and we have an amazing intro now. That's amazing. That's so great. All right. Uh, so it's been 15 years since Pluto was kicked out of the Planet Club. It also happens to be the topic of our very first episode of Astronomy Cast more than 600 episodes ago. Are there any updates? Does Pluto have a chance of regaining planethood status again? And I'm assuming we're going to take a break now? Sure. Let's take a break. And we're back. All right, so I guess we should kind of catch, I mean, for people who don't know what happened to poor Pluto, why don't we catch people up briefly on what happened? So poor Pluto, it was officially discovered in 1930. It had appeared in a few images prior to that, but hadn't been like identified as Pluto prior to 1930. And when it was first found, it was the culmination of Percival Lowell funding Lowell Observatory and saying there is another world out there and we're going to find it. And when Clyde Tombaugh found it, all of the astronomers were like, that's really not enough light for what we were looking for. And maybe we don't actually need another large world out there. We think we can explain Newton now. Newton. We think we can explain Neptune now. And um, nevertheless, Percival Lowell and everyone else involved in making his dream come true had decided a priori, they were finding a planet. So Pluto, Pluto became our ninth planet until 2006, when during a meeting of the International Astronomical Union, folks were like, look, Pluto is no longer the biggest thing out in the Kuiper Belt. There's this thing called Eris. And Cirrus lost its planethood when we found the rest of the asteroid belt. So let's make Pluto something else. It was more complicated than that. There were more details to that, but that is the TLDR version of what happened. And in 2006, an entire room full of professional astronomers from around the world raised their colored pieces of paper that designate, yes, I am a member of this organization. And holding those high, they, in a kind of close vote, downvoted, yeah. Pluto status, and it was determined we're now going to have dwarf planets and Pluto would be the lead object in a new group called Plutinos. And I don't think anyone's really used that word since. No, no, it's definitely fallen out of favor. Were you there for that 
vote? No, okay. no, I actually, uh, so 2006, I was that August moving from Boston to Edwardsville to start my job as a professor. The very next IAU, I would become a member, but that particular IAU, I was, I was coming up with this show, enjoying just married life and realizing, wow, home ownership is a lot. A lot. <laughs> right, right. But normally you do attend the International Astronomical Union meetings and you've been to others since. Yes. Yeah. And, and every year the question comes up, is this the year we're going to reopen that can of worms? And every year we're like, nope, this is yeah. not. Okay, so so then that was how pluto lost its planetoid status and of course you know the very first episode if you want to go all the way back to episode one you can hear us discuss in great detail exactly what happened during that whole back and forth but you just mentioned briefly that every four years or so astronomers go should we talk about it nah <laughs> what has happened since so poor pluto and poor alan stern Prior to 2006 and that great demotion, the New Horizons spacecraft had taken off on a journey of exploration that would launch it as the fastest thing to leave the Earth and head towards the outer solar system. That New Horizons spacecraft was the culmination of decades of effort to finally get a mission that would go to the world that the Voyagers hadn't made it to. And in the launch footage, they refer to Pluto as a planet. And prior to us actually getting New Horizons to Pluto, the best images we had came from the Hubble Space Telescope. And those Hubble Space Telescopes were enough to show us that Pluto and its moon Charon were pretty similar in size, that there were these additional little moonlets like Hydra that hung out. And it was a very dissatisfying image. And researchers were literally searching the noise in the data to figure out what was noise and what was moonlit. We found moons. And as the New Horizons spacecraft went on its way, there was this realization of, wait, Pluto and Charon are fairly much the same size. There's all of these little moons. What if all of those moons actually occupy a disk of debris? Leading up to the flyby. So, so there was a whole lot of research done to try and figure out from the Earth, or at least Earth's orbit, if there was a debris disk. And it was eventually realized, no, there's not. And as New Horizons approached that summer holiday encounter with Pluto, we got to see more and more of the planet. And at an unfortunately large distance, we realized that Pluto has on one of its sides a series of tiger stripes not identical to what we see on Enceladus, but nevertheless quite marked. But the mission was too far away to really make sense of this incredibly dynamic feature set. And as we got closer and closer, or brother, as New Horizons got closer and closer, Pluto rotated. And the side that was closest as we got there was the side that has heart, Sputnik mm -hmm. Planitia. And it was really this incredible experience to go from seeing these crazy tiger stripes, chaotic terrain, to the heart started to rotate into view. We watched the heart rotate across view. And just as the heart started to leave, we had our closest approach. So, you know, you mentioned that they called Pluto a planet as the spacecraft was launching. But I, you know, principal investigator Alan Stern will call Pluto a planet to this day. It's so, true. Yeah. So, and, so and he be, still burns a candle for Pluto. And, yeah. and to be fair, the definition they came up with isn't one that allows exoplanets to be planets. Yes. And that isn't rooted in geology or geophysics. It was astronomers who defined things for the planetary community. The 
I mean, the, the observations made by New Horizons of Pluto were stunning, like nothing we'd ever seen. It showed us how different Sharon was from Pluto. It showed that Pluto has an atmosphere that had just been theorized up until this point. It showed the just the landscape, the glaciers, the ice mountains. It was much had much more geography than anybody was ever expecting. Did any of this just like crack the heart? Did any of this like crack the hearts at all of the stern astronomers who had voted Pluto out of the Planet Club in the first place? I love the pun. Um, so, so I think a lot of our hearts cracked, but then they cracked again when the Dawn mission got to Ceres and Vesta. And now we have a whole new view and a whole new argument to open. Right. Well, we'll get to that argument in a second, but let's have another break. And we're back. All right. So we were just about to open up another argument about who gets to be a planet and why and why not. So one of my favorite moments was sitting in the audience at a European Planetary Sciences Conference in Madrid and listening to the Dawn team refer to Vesta an asteroid in the asteroid belt that is not round because it got hit with something really big that made it go squish. As, as they discussed Vesta, they called it a planet. <laughs> and to be fair to Vesta, one of the rules about what makes a world a planet is has it collapsed down so that gravitationally it has become a sphere because hydrostatic equilibrium has been reached and Vesta did that and then got squished and and then I hear people again on the Dawn mission talking about Ceres which is round which is the OG former planet as a planet because it has geysers it has geology it's differentiated and so when we look at Pluto and we see a world that surface is constantly changing we believe that in areas its surface has been around for less time than bees have been on the planet earth <laughs> right when we look at the largest asteroids and we see differentiated worlds that are geologically active the question becomes okay where do we draw the line people how do you define planet, not planet? And a lot of people, and I'm one of them, is just like, okay, we need a geology argument. Can we please promote Ceres and Vesta? And, and it's the fact that that and ends us up with dozens of objects that causes a lot of folks to go, we can't do that to the children. They can't memorize that many planets. Yeah, it's it's funny, like, like the proposal that 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 Alan Stern and others have made is let's just make anything that has hydrostatic equilibrium be a planet, anything that is a sphere or trying really hard to be a sphere. Let's just call it a planet, even the moons. And like, when you think about it that way, like imagine we were like using James Webb and we were observing some distant exoplanetary system and we saw a bunch of objects in orbit around it we would just count up the dots of light and say there are five planets even if one was smaller than pluto we'd call it a planet so i think it's perfectly reasonable for us to um to just call them all planets it's also perfectly reasonable just to call the the big ones planets it's also just doesn't matter and, and this is where I, I have quite purposefully tried to eradicate the word, word planet largely from my vocabulary. That's because me too. Yeah, I, I, I yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I want to make it clear, Titan is a world with an amazing thick yeah. atmosphere that we have things like Io that showcase geology like nothing else in the solar system. These orbit big old planets, but they're worlds. And yeah. it just, it's, if 
if Endor is a moon and can support Ewoks, let's call it a world and use that definition and be done with it. So have we even close at this point to for the International Astronomical Union bringing back the topic and potentially holding another vote? Because I've definitely heard rumors. So, so there is always a group that is like, we need to put together a resolution, but the resolution never makes it all the way to the point of being voted on. And, and this is because, uh, well, on one hand, a lot of the folks who are upset don't actually want to work with the IAU anymore. They had their heart broken, they've moved on. And so they're trying to make the change through the literature, through books, through active engagement, but not necessarily by working it through the system. And within the system, I mean, there's a lot of inertia and there's kind of been a pandemic, so we haven't really met when we were supposed to. And honestly, I think a lot of us are holding our breath to see just what Michael Brown finds once the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is now Vera Rubin Observatory, starts looking at the outer solar system. Right. So, I mean, I guess one of the big things that's happened in the 15 years of Pluto's demotion is just the vast number of Kuiper Belt objects yeah. that have been found out in that region. There have been, there are now many, many objects that are roughly the size of Pluto. And so would you say that that argument is starting to prove out to be the right decision? So where it gets confusing is we either need to say everything that is around in an hydrostatic equilibrium and doesn't orbit something that isn't a star um, is a planet. I'm, I'm willing to have the planet moon separation. I'm down with that. Um, and that would give us Ceres, that would give us Eris, that would give us so many of these large icy bodies in the outer solar system. Or when we start finding other gignormous things out there and it's thought that there's another, another potential ice giant or gas giant out there, the so-called Planet Nine, and there are new hints of a Mars-sized object, a potential Planet 10 out there as well, if we can find these other Mars and gas or ice giant sized worlds, I can see the dichotomy between the 10 massive planets and all the tiny things being maintained because there is a fairly significant size gap, but we're still stuck in the fact that like Mercury is tiny. And it really becomes hard to justify Mercury as a planet. So I'm sort of like, we either need to ditch Mercury because you know whatever's in the Kuiper Belt won't have cleared its, its orbit out, or let's just accept all of the stuff. So it's either give me Eris, give me Pluto, give me Ceres, give me all of these, or take away Mercury when we find those two additional worlds. Right. Pick one, All right. please. Well, I want to, I want to explore this idea that there may be more larger objects out there in the solar system, and we'll get to that in a second. But it's time for another break, and we're back. Now, you mentioned briefly that there's a potentially a, a planet nine, something fairly large, maybe a Mars. How have we discovered these? As we've gotten better and better, and done more and more surveys of the sky we've uncovered giant blocks of ice and rock, Kuiper belt objects, some round, some not, that have orbits that aren't exactly random, aren't at all circular, and numerically point to the influence of some other large body out there in a very specific and calculatable orbit. What it doesn't tell us is where on that orbit that so-called Planet Nine might be. And this is where uh, 
I'm going to destroy his name, and I have so many apologies. Konstantin Boygagen, Badigan, Konstantin Badigan, and Michael Brown. Uh, they're the observer and mathematician pair. I mean, astrophysicist, but the one running all of the numerical models, who who've gone through and figured out. Okay. At what percentage can what we see for orbits out there be created randomly? And while it's possible that it's random, it's possible at such a low level that I feel like there's got to be something else out there influencing our solar system. Now the evidence for a tenth object, a Mars-sized object, is much, much less. We're going to be doing an interview on the Daily Space hopefully next week with one of the people who published about that. Um, but it's important to realize Sometimes you can see invisible forces in the motions of others. When you're looking at a human battling the wind, leaning 30 degrees forward into that wind, you know there's something there preventing them from falling down. When we look at the orbits, we know there's something preventing them from hmm. circulating. And you mentioned the large synoptic survey, the Vera Rubin Observatory. This is going to be the machine that will find them. So give people a bit of an update on what's going to happen with that. So like so many things, this telescope's completion has been delayed by the current pandemic. When it does finally come online, hopefully within the next 12 months, it's going to be surveying the entire southern viewable sky every few nights. And it's going to be surveying it down to mid 20th magnitude. And this means that if there's a planet nine or planet 10 out there and it's in the southern hemisphere sky or the southern part of the northern sky, it's going to be able to find it over the course of its first year of observations. That constant repeating cadence means that anything that's moving, however slowly, that motion is going to show up. It's, it's possible that we already have images, but because of the spacing of the observations, we can't see the motion of the object. It's possible. Now, unfortunately, there is the potential that it's actually in the Northern Hemisphere right now. And if it is, we either need to wait for it to move, which could take decades, century, or uh, we need to wait for a Northern Hemisphere Massive Observatory to be built, and that would be the TMT, which currently isn't being built. I mean, people are always surprised to hear, like we know, like if we knew exactly where Planet Nine was, yeah, it would be resolvable easily in most of the world's big observatories. They could all resolve it as a dot it would be easy to spot in the Hubble Space Telescope. James Webb will would reveal all kinds of details about it. But the trick is to know where to look. Yeah. And space, the sky is really big. And so people don't realize just how many tiny little pinpricks you could be looking at across the, the night sky. And yeah. the key with the, with the Vera Rubin Observatory is that it's going to be looking at all of them simultaneously, waiting to catch those little movements to find those new objects. So... So here we are, I guess, in 2021. It's been 15 years since Pluto lost its uh, eminent status as one of the uh, planets of the solar system. Place your bets. Do you think that, like, let's imagine a world that Planet 9 is found, Planet 10 are, is found. So we know that there's, say, a Neptune-sized object out there and a Mars-sized object, and maybe even another one, maybe an Earth-sized object even farther out. Does Pluto somehow make its way back in, or it will, will that just make the case against it even worse? I think it will make the case against it even worse. Yeah. And I suspect that this will be one of those things that astronomers argue 
yes. definition. And at some point, people are going to be like, okay, you have to use adjectives. You have to use adjectives. We will count it as a planet, but it's a dwarf, and you better say dwarf. Earth is a terrestrial planet. You better say terrestrial. I kind of see a future where adjectives are required. Right. Well, maybe in 15 years from now, after we do episode 1200, we will, we will have an update and an answer for people. Uh, thank you, Pamela. <laughs> thank you, Fraser. And you have some names for us. I do. I also you have do. a dog okay. that is sitting here licking me. Like I, in the last commercial break, I had to like push the head down. I, I will invite you up in a moment. You have to wait. Um, so our, okay. Our, our show is here thanks to the generous contributions of so many of you out there. Your patronage on patreon.com slash astronomycast makes this possible. And this week, I would like to thank Bill Nash, Janelle Duncan, Helga Borkog, Richard, Kevin Parker, David Trug, Janelle Duncan. It's the names are repeating. Okay. Okay, we will edit that in post. I have no clue why the names are showing up twice. We're gonna stop there. And, and I just wanna say, it's good to have you back, Fraser. It's good to be back. Thanks everyone. And, um, and we'll see you all next week. All right, and then they saved. All right, And then Thank as you. I said, I've, I've got You've a got rule. To run. So. Okay, I'll hang out and answer some questions. I'm just going to move over to the desk. Yeah, where are I can you see kidding? Things. I can go now. I don't you need can. to be. Uh, I don't need to to engineer this thing. This is really weird. I'm feeling <laughs> now. I feel like a control freak. Are you going to be okay? Yeah, you've you've probably done more live stream engineering in the last year than I've maybe done in my entire career. So I think you'll be. Uh, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> it it comes right. with doing a daily show. All of I you? know, a daily show. What yeah. kind of masochist decides to do that? All right, well, you keep the party rolling. Um, I'll roll, and I promise I'll do my upload. Okay. So thanks, everyone. Have fun with, with Pamela. How do I even turn this thing off? I guess I'm just going to uh, close just the leave. browser. Yeah. All right. All right, here goes. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> bye, bye All right, so I, I have to move my camera, move my mic. You have all been warned. There is a moment of chaos about to occur. And Beth, if you want to come on camera, you're welcome to. I'll... Okay, hold on. Whee! And now all of you know, I've gained weight during COVID and I have a Coke Zero problem. All right, I'm gonna bring Beth on screen with me in just a second. And you can meet our wonderful producer for today's episode. Uh, there's Beth, there. Hello and welcome on screen. You, you are, I, moved too quickly i'm sorry no it's okay uh my my kid just wandered by uh cowie got him good on a finger so i was oh yeah <laughs> i was like wait what so cowie is a koshka um yes cowie is for those of you on youtube who are unfamiliar i have many cats as pamela has many dogs and um apparently
of them just decided that my son needed to be reminded of who's the uh, alpha in this house and it's not my kid. <laughs> all right, all right. So um, one moment and I'm going to start trying to find questions. Oh man, so many questions, so many questions. Um, um, weekly space hangout people help. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where to oh look. Oh my gosh, there is just so much chat. I can't even. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go up to the top um, and then look for question marks. So many happy noises, so many happy noises. Uh, sorry for all the chaos at the beginning. It's, it's a new day, a new layout, and i um, still figuring it out. Um, uh, let's take the human history a few centuries into the future. We are doing great. Nuclear fusion is solved. Earth is a paradise. The solar system is being colonized. What is the use of Pluto? Uh, mining water. Ah, there you go. Hello, everybody. Hello, Melinda. Um, a last okay. pit stop on the way to the Kuiper Belt. Yes, there you go. Yes, yes. Well, it's in the Kuiper Belt. So the best pit stop in the Kuiper Belt? Sure. Let's go with that. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Scrolling for questions. So many of you. It's awesome. Yes, there's an opening. Does Stella have a mic? No, she just likes to get a bit close to my mic. Such a big, giant. All right. Hal McKinney, Hal McKinney asks, what are the closest things useful for the telescope that shall not be named to look at? We seem to focus on faraway stuff. Might there be use cases for looking at Mars bound spacecraft or near Earth space rocks or Earth's moon? Um, I, I don't even think it could focus on the moon. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it can't focus on the moon. I think it's too close and too, yeah, it's too close yeah. and too bright if I'm it, right. It certainly can't track at the right speed. Uh -uh. Um, one of the things you have to worry about is how fast things are moving across the sky. I believe that it may be able to do asteroid rates. It can definitely do Kuiper Belt rates. Um, it just has to get there first. And that's the problem. It has to get there. And yeah, the opening is very Doctor Who. It was written by David Joseph Wesley. And we we basically told him what inspired us. And Doctor Who's part of it. And that's where it came from. Uh, Larry Beck asks, what, pro what proves Ceres did not clear its orbit? It's a little tiny thing, tiny thing called the main asteroid belt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's in the main asteroid belt with everything else that's in the main asteroid belt. So, unfortunately, it, it falls into that. Oh, see, when they found it, they were looking for something in between Mars and Jupiter going, we think this there sh there's, a, there's a calculation of where planets should be in our solar system. And that was a spot they thought we should have a planet there. So they started looking for it. And Ceres being the biggest one was the first one that they found. And they went, oh, we found a planet. And then they found Vesta. <laughs> and then they went, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think there's a couple things in between Vesta and Ceres. I think Vesta's four. But they started finding more and more of these things. And then it was yeah. like, well, maybe Ceres isn't a planet after all. So remember, when you get mad about Pluto, Ceres got demoted from a planet to an asteroid. Yeah. And, and I see people asking if I'm on a room mic and mentioning clattering, which you probably just heard again. I, there is a bug in the current version of Wirecast. I need to see if an update has been released where I, it will not work with my uh, good mic. So we recorded good audio on a separate track. Yeah. And my neighbors have a leaf blower. All right, so yeah, you were hearing room noise, you were hearing dogs. Uh, looking for more questions. So we got Hells, we got Larry Beckham's. 
Um, so Quad Libet writes, let's take humanity. Oh, we already did that one too. We did that one. I didn't see any more in YouTube. So, okay, um, let's go back up to Twitch. So Veronica to Cure it. says, why not switch to major planets and minor planets? I kind of adore that. And there is the minor planet center, minor planet mm -hmm. center, mm -hmm. that takes care of comets, asteroids, and Kuiper Belt objects. So I think minor planets is a good way to go. I, I honestly prefer the term minor planet to dwarf planet. So yeah, I, so, it sort of gives a better description to me. Yeah. So, so Keeper of Maps asks, how would Pamela have voted? So at the time back in 2006, <coughs> that was a dog, sorry. At the time, back in 2006, I, I was very much of the, yeah, Pluto's not a planet, because at the time we didn't know that there was geological activity on it or any of the asteroids. And so my take was that the larger objects were differentiated, were geologically active, or had been geologically active. And that the asteroids and the Kuiper Belt objects were just basically rounded off chunks of rock and ice. and that's not a planet. And then New Horizons and Dawn did their thing and we learned we were wrong in many directions. Many directions. <laughs> and, and so today with the added information from these additional spacecraft, um, yeah, Bennu, not a planet. Ryugu, not a planet. Vesta, Ceres, New Horizons. I'm good with calling those planets or not, but base it on geology folks and tell me why yeah i uh i'm sort of agnostic on the whole pluto is a planet thing um my my kid is is very pluto is a planet and and uh was was badly served how old and was he when it was demoted now keep in mind my son just turned 15 so he yeah, was not in ex I mean, he was in existence, but he was not. Uh, he was still a symbiote at that time. Yeah, so, there have yeah. been adults seriously influencing that child. Like, oh, and it's not me. I I look at him and I say, look, it, it it's a it's a dwarf planet. It's a Kuiper Belt object. It's a trans Neptunian object. There's a lot of things it is. It's just not a planet by the definition they have set out, and he just disagrees with me. <laughs> vehemently and has since he was like four or five like he is just absolutely upset that pluto is not considered one of our major planets so so over on youtube hal asks which planet in our solar system has the littlest biggest mountain so what is the largest of the rocky worlds is earth the largest or is venus the largest so whichever is the larger rocky world will have the smallest, biggest planet. So I'm pretty sure it's between us and Venus, but I don't the know. The problem is, is that we can't really see what Venus has. Yeah, around. but the radar returns would have been good enough. But, mm, yeah, but we just don't have as many of those as we would like. So. No, but enough for at this scale. So, so this I is would, where... I would say it's probably going to be Venus because Venus's atmosphere is so much thicker. So there's a lot of pressure on the surface as well. And so that's gonna keep mountains from getting higher. So Maxwell Monts is the tallest mountain on Venus and it is 6.8 miles above mean planetary radius. How big is Everest above mean planetary radius? Which I think we call sea level. I don't. Okay. I don't remember. Everest. <laughs> hey. And if you're enjoying watching Beth and I prattle aimlessly together, you can catch the two of us on the Daily Space where we are co-hosts. She is also going to be producing astronomy cast and controlling the images in the background and is a planetary scientist by training. So, so file your complaints with me. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Everest is like half the height. So apparently yeah. we have the biggest, we have the littlest, biggest mountain. Right. <laughs> there, there is a poll going on on Cosmo Quest's Twitch um, where it's currently, it's, it's the poll 
uh, was, is Pluto going to be reclassified? And by 54%, no one. Um, <laughs> So we're currently going out live on Twitch at CosmoQuest X and on YouTube for Astronomy Cast. Um, so let's see. I'm looking for more questions. So so Zach asks, whoa, I scrolled. Uh, Zach asked something and then I scrolled. Zach asked, could the belts eventually coalesce given enough time or are they doomed to be asteroids, mine old planets forever? They're doomed. At this point, if they hit, they create smaller things, not bigger things. Um, all right. So scroll. Yeah. I mean, I think like the only thing that could happen is if you had like a, a rogue planet or a star that wandered by and disturbed stuff. But mostly what that does is just send comets in from the Oort cloud. Uh, Arjan asks, the further out you are, wouldn't it be that much harder to clear the orbit, even if you were Earth-sized? Yes. And this is one of the major arguments that gets used is, according to numerical simulations, if you put the planet Earth out in the Kuiper belt, it wouldn't have sufficient gravitational influence to clear its orbit. So the Earth would not actually be a planet if you placed it in the Kuiper belt. But then Neptune counts as a planet, even though... It's there are trans-Neptunian objects. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Pluto's orbit crosses that of Neptune's. It just does it at like this. Yeah. So the <laughs> argument currently being used is uh, there's kind of like an asterisk where it's like has cleared its orbit of similar sized objects. So like Jupiter with the Trojans that are in like the exact same orbit pretty much. Mm -hmm. It counts as having cleared its orbit of Jupiter-sized objects. Earth has cleared its orbit of Earth-sized objects. Right. Uh, so Arctotupus, James, go ahead. Go ahead. Arctotupus, uh, James, <laughs> Pamela. Arctotupus asks, is it possible that a planet exists outside the heliosphere? I don't know. I've, I've given up on making predictions. It shouldn't, but the universe likes to prove us wrong. I'm going to go with that. It shouldn't, but. Uh, James Dugan asks, Olympus Mons is a volcano. Can it be classified as a mountain? Well, I suppose yeah. we could get into semantics and say, what do you determine as a mountain? Because Mount St. Helens is considered a mountain and it's a volcano. So I'm going to go with. Mount Rainier. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mountains, yeah. mountains can be volcanoes. Not all volcanoes are mountains. Not all mountains are volcanoes, but there is crossover. There's a, there's an overlapping Venn diagram there. And unless it explodes itself apart, like Krakatoa or Mount St. Helens, a mountain, once it hits its peak height, and a volcano, once it meets its peak height, both get weathered by the same weather and other dynamic forces. So young volcanoes and young created via tectonics mountains are both going to be extremely tall and things are going to get worn down as they get older and older. So um, while they form in different ways, they get worn down the same and it takes geology to differentiate them by looking at how they're made after a while. Yeah, what they're made out of. Yeah. So. Um, scrolling the chat hit Fraser's pun. Um, <laughs> play between Twitch and YouTube is about 20 seconds. Dang. Um, sufficiently agitated used an amazingly pretty heart emote over on Twitch. Uh, okay. So I it's hit. It's just so nice to see all these names. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to see I've, all I've, of you. I've missed, I've missed all of you guys. We'll have to get back what, next week. It should go much more smoothly, and Fraser will have time. And Fraser and Pamela will have time to do their greens, yeah, and all of that. Um, today was just sort of a everything. YouTube. We test. We test drove it a little bit. We did not test drive it all the way, and it it crashed and burned, and we had to back up. Yeah. So so DPI is trying to get meteor, meteoroid, and meteorite straight. So okay. meteoroid, asteroid, they're both in space. So remember, if it has the same ending as asteroid in space, 
it's a meteor when it's coming down and it's a meteorite when you can hold it in your hand. Exactly that. And a, a, a bolide is a very bright fireball of a meteor crashing through our atmosphere and flaming up. Yeah. Um, a, a fireball is basically any sort of meteor that comes in and brightens up the sky like that. However, we haven't determined necessarily what it is. But a bolide is definitely a meteor fireball. Okay. So on the diagonal asks, um, how do astronomers use the word meteor and does the word meteoroid get used? Okay, I, I just answered that. Sorry, sorry, time lag. And then on the diagonal goes, ask, goes on to ask, so meteor is a physical object, not the light generated by the falling object. Yes. Correct. Correct. So meteors make streaks in the sky and can sometimes be shown on radar. Mm -hmm. uh, so John Suffel asks, cork stars. Are theoretical but could they exist in reality don't know the universe is weird um uh hal mckinney yeah. asks would a strong laser pointing the direction hubble is looking be able to indicate if it passes near a planet x by observing the laser beam curve um if we could build that kind of a laser we don't ex we don't have the power to power it uh, the issue is that even though laser beams are tightly focused, they do spread out. So a, a laser beam that's like normal tiny laser beam exiting the laser and across the size of a room, by the time it gets to the moon is meters and meters and meters and meters across. And that's just the moon. And so the power output needed to shine a light capable of still reflecting back in noticeable number of photons at the distance that we're expecting planet nine or planet 10 to be we just don't have the power for that and and if we did we'd really be lighting ourselves up for any aliens out there that might be looking our way so maybe not do that that's that's true too yeah i think the best way to find planet x would be if it um occults a star yeah, but the if you're not doing the right high speed photometry that allow you to see the entire curve, the entire light curve of the occultation, you're yeah. just going to think there's something wrong with your detector. <laughs> yeah, it helps to know where it is first. Like yeah. that's that's the big problem is figuring out it's if if it orbits what 10 times the distance of Neptune. Yeah. Um that's, that's hundreds of years. Yeah, that's that's, that's a huge orbit. So yeah. it in if your we could standard, narrow it down. In your standard imperfect photometry with a medium-sized professional telescope, it's going to be moving fractions of its own diameter on the detector. And that's just not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> It's so Arjun makes the great point that if we could shoot lasers like that, we could do the star shot to Planet Nine, which is a way of using a light sail and a laser to accelerate uh, spacecraft across the solar system. All right, so I think we've made it through the questions. I still haven't had lunch. I don't think you've had lunch. I have not had lunch, and the the kid is is poking me for lunch. So and I'm to starting that. to get spinny, which is my body poking me for lunch. Are we doing community after hours tonight? Do we know? Uh, possibly. I don't. I haven't heard any objections yet, but okay. I haven't had a chance to ping the the mod team. So there okay. may or may not be. Um, watch watch our Twitter. I'll have an announcement one way or the other. So so astronomy cast is a joint production of Universe Today and Cosmo Quest. Your donations, your patronage are tax deductible through the Planetary Science Institute, the home of CosmoQuest. And we have so much more content on both of our platforms. Universe Today has Guide to Space. Uh, uh, oh man, he has another video show I have just forgotten the name of entirely. He does. Open his Space. Open Space. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's the one that fell out. Uh, he does a variety of Q&As. And then, of course, the Universe Today website is your place to get all that is new in space and astronomy written out in glorious detail. Now, if you want short and sweet, check us out over at CosmoQuest, where we put together the Daily Space Show. We're about 
20 minutes of content every day highlighting our favorites on the latest discoveries. Beth and I, as well as Eric Mattis, I write for that. Ali Wilson, I Annie Gordon Dewis. What did I? I got. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, Ali Pelfrey is our producer. <sighs> And she also does the video production here at Astronomy Cast, where Richard Drum does the audio. We also have over at CosmoQuest 365 Days of Astronomy, which is Richard Drum and executive producer uh, Aviva Yamani. I, we're a whole team. We do a lot of different things. We're getting ready to come out with a Spanish language show, uh, Vision Cosmica, that will be done in part by Andreas Plazas, that some of you may remember from the past. So if you if you are following us on on if you follow CosmoQuest on social media both on Twitter and on Instagram, uh, we have links to at least the Twitter feeds for all of these shows and uh, come check them out. Make sure you subscribe, review, and share because yeah. that's the way we grow our community and we get more of this information out there to the ears that need and want to hear it. And now is the time to like totally embrace daily space because we have hit our stride and I'm super proud of what we're putting out day after day. So come get everything. Come to Astronomy Cast to get the lasting news, the lasting stories that will stay true year after year. Come to daily space to find out what we think we know today and what we hope to find out tomorrow. And with that, um, I am going to go ahead and say, wherever you are in the world. Have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. Stay safe, everyone. Take Go care. Ahead. All of that stuff. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, get vaccinated if you can, and uh, we'll, we're gonna, we're getting through this, and we are, we are definitely excited to be back and bringing you more space science. And from Fraser, Ali, the entire rest of the crew, Richard, thanks for being here, and stay safe, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>